on, on the build. Uh, it's a fire station in Bay St. Louis. Next. Next. Okay. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Went a little too far. Um, and then this is one of the other projects that I have. Uh, go ahead and go. Yeah. This is one of the other projects that I have. It's 32 units of affordable housing in a, in a city called Pass Christiane along the coast. Um, and I'm a, uh, the project manager for the uh, development team here. And uh, we hope to start construction on these homes sometime this summer and um, hope to make these really, really nice, sustainable, affordable homes. And I, I think this is a, a really exciting project because I get to have um, a lot of say in the kind of materials that we put in the houses to make sure that they're safe and healthy and, and that we make the houses energy efficient and make them easy to maintain and, and all of that. So I, I'm really excited about this project. Next. So that's, that's enough about me, and, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and see if there's any questions before we go, get into the lesson. So South Plantation, Michael just shared um, a fantastic presentation about his work in uh, the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. Do you have any questions for him? Um, we can't see the guy. Okay. Um, you guys don't need to see me. Okay. Will Will or did homes get more damage from the wind or the flooding during Hurricane Katrina? Thank you. Great, great question. Um, <laughs> and we're still trying to figure that out, or at least the lawyers and the insurance companies are trying to figure that out. It's it, it's a tricky question. Um, what happens when when a hurricane comes? Uh, uh, to land, and, and I'm sure you all know this, that the pressure in a hurricane is very, very low. So what happens is it, it actually sort of pulls the water up and makes makes kind of a dome uh, of the water, and that's what that's what the surge comes from. Um, but it's also moving, and it's moving you know anywhere from 10 to 20 miles an hour. So when whenever you sort of have something moving in the water, it's going to make a wave, is it not? Um, but there's also high, high winds, and those high, high winds are also blowing the water even higher. So um, it, it's, it's, it's really hard to kind of say there was more water, more damage from water or from wind. It, it, it's kind of damage from wind-driven water. Um, but I do have to say, I, I mean, if I had to say it, I'd have to say more of the problem was water. Um, wa the water was devastating. Water was devastating across the coast. Um, because of the sheer power that it has, the weight of the water is so heavy. Um, and, and you all probably saw more of what happened to New Orleans and, and, and how when a city floods like that, it completely um, devastates it. Um, but it's a tricky, uh, it's a tricky uh, uh, argument to talk about uh, wind and water. It still is three years later down here. But great question. Great. Thanks, Alexis. Anyone else from South Plantation? During Hurricane Wilma, there was a lot of wind damage more than any flood damage. Do you have any suggestions on how to incorporate a wind resist or air, the, the compromise between flood protection and uh, wind protection? Sure. You know, I, I think that... that um, we have the the wind protection down pretty well. Um, I, I really uh, can't say for for uh, specifically what failed during Wilma, but um, a lot of things failed because they weren't done right. Um, because we have the engineering, we have the um, uh, research, we have all of those things that tell us that if we do these things the right way, they shouldn't blow off in the winds. Now. Um, some of these storms create winds and microbursts in little pockets of areas that nothing can uh, it, it can can withstand unless you have a concrete bunker, um, and and you know we just don't build homes like that. Um, so uh, you know I, I think that 
using the International Building Code regulations and the Hurricane Building Code, you have a much better chance of surviving or your building has a much better chance of surviving if it wasn't up to code. And I think that's been proven time and time again that buildings that are built to, co to the code um, uh, survive uh, at a much greater rate than buildings that hadn't been. Um, and, and we see that a lot in hurricanes where the older building stocks get destroyed because they're not built as well and they don't have the um, same um, same kind of structural requirements as the other ones. Now I say that they're built, uh, not built as well, and we're going to get into this and I'm going to contradict myself when it comes to environmental health, but as far as the structure goes, I think we have a little bit more research behind us to make the houses um, more wind resistant. And where can the students find the building codes? Um, uh, uh, yeah, I guess the uh, the city building department will probably have some copies that you might be able to uh, borrow or whatnot. The building code's hard to find, it, it, partly because it's so expensive to buy. Um, I don't imagine that the, the school would have a copy of it. Um, but uh, any of your local architecture firms would probably have, they should have a copy of it, and, and they may even have an older copy that you might be able to borrow. Um, uh, they're, they're not easy to find. The library should have a copy also, the public library. Um, so you can find some things in there. The, you know, 90% of the building code for homes you can find in, a, in, in any kind of those little guides at Lowe's or Home Depot. Um, they give you pointers on, on what to do and they give you parts of the code. And 90% um, of what you need to know about making a, a house strong is in one of those um, little flip books that cost like 15 bucks. Um, so there's a few places you can find that information out, but uh, the, the actual code is a real thick, dense book um, that uh, we only get out if we really need to. It sounds like a lot of fun reading, right, students? Oh. So if you don't have any additional questions, we'll move on with the presentation. So South Plantation, any additional questions? Anyone else? All right, let's move on. Then. Oh, okay, go ahead. Go um, ahead. Elevating the buildings in the air, wouldn't it make the buildings uh, more prone to wind damage or being destroyed if it's elevated 12 feet in the air? How have you guys managed to counteract that and keeping the building stable during uh, a hurricane? If it's tough, it's Another great question. Another great question. Uh, and we, we have this debate all the time, um, especially right after the storm. There were a lot of people who were um, saying that we were putting people in danger by elevating the homes that much. Um, what we use is, you know, we use sound engineering principles. And um, one of the things that the Architecture and Humanity Program, I think, really helped out in uh, finding out was what kind of foundation system should we use. When, when you elevate that high, how do you make sure that um, when the wind blows against that house, that foundation is not going to fail? Because basically you have a flagpole, and then you have a house on top of that flagpole. Um, and uh, so we, we uh, tried out a lot of different foundations at a lot of different elevations, um, and came to the conclusion that driving piles, which means we get big pieces of, of, of timber, um, eight, eight inches by eight inches or ten inches by ten inches square, um, and we hammer it into the ground. And we hammer it into the ground at least eight feet, um, in some places more. Um, and they stick out of the ground eight feet. So it's, it's almost like taking a big nail and hammering it into the ground. Um, and those, those piles are skin friction piles, we call them, and the actual sort of earth is holding that pile in place. And um, even if you get water to kind of take away a lot of the, the dirt around there, it, it's still going to be strong and it's still going to hold in place. The other connection that you have to be really uh, sort of careful about is how the house connects to that foundation. And um, we went through a lot of research on how 
um, a lot of different people made those connections, and, and I think that we've come to some really strong